Hello everyone, this is John Paul Prime, and I'm feeling pretty good right now because a very special person has agreed to allow me to interview him. Uh, this young man is one of the most well-known Christian vloggers on YouTube, Venom Fang X. Christian or otherwise, he's certainly one of the most intriguing personalities that I've ever come across here. I mean, everybody, anybody who's seen a Venom Fang X video knows that Sean has been blessed with a uh, natural charisma that accentuates the other thing he's blessed with, and that's his ability to communicate very effectively. How are you doing tonight, Sean? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Um, you seem to exude self-confidence. Um, if self-confidence was a smell, you'd probably... You know, you'd be reeking of it. And that's, I guess that's a ridiculous analogy, but how long have you... I mean, have you always been such a commanding public speaker? Uh, no, not, not at all. Um, I'm actually... I mean, I, I'm, I've been two different people in my life. I mean, I became a Christian back in 2006, and the person I was before then was a very different kind of person. Um one that you wouldn't recognize if if I was making videos at that point, which I wasn't. Um, I wasn't a public figure or or making any any videos at all uh, back then. I was in film school, but you know that's just private stuff that I was working on. And um, before then, uh, not much to speak of. So no, I, I sort of came into uh, the the public light once I started making YouTube videos and. Uh, the confidence that I have is just, uh, I, would, I would replace that with conviction. I'm just, I'm very convicted that what I'm saying is true and, and needs to be proclaimed with a certain amount of confidence, if the word is to be used, uh, because I am, indeed, yeah, I am confident that, that I'm right and that the Bible is true and that what, I, what I'm saying on YouTube, that my, my message is true. So, mm -hmm. Well, tell me what, what precipitated your decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Um, I, I have given my testimony uh, on YouTube before, so uh, in, in case the audience listening has heard it before, I'll, I'll give just a sort of summarized version of it. I was kicked out of Hebrew school at a very young age for telling my teachers that I did not believe in God and that I believed in evolution, because that's what I was being taught uh, in grade one, I remember quite distinctly. And so I had remained a professing atheist until about 20 years old, back in 2006, when I came across... Uh, this all happened in a single day, so it wasn't a, a long-term transition. Rather, what had happened was I watched a movie called The Exorcism of Emily Rose, which you may or may not have seen, and the end of the movie, it says that it was based on a true story, so that confused me because of the events in the film. I, I wanted to know which of it was, was true and which was not, so I went onto the Internet Movie Database into the message board, the forum there, and someone linked to... Uh, Dr. Kent Hovind's creation seminars, and so I turned those on and started watching, and about 20 minutes into the video, before uh, really any arguments were being given, I just had an awareness that God was in the room with me, and I just became uh, aware uh, of the reality of God. Now, the reason I didn't revert back to Judaism, why I became a Christian, is because the man speaking in, these, in this video was, was not a Jew, but he was telling me about the God of the Jews. He, he was a Christian, but he was telling me about things I had learned in Hebrew school, like Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark and the Garden of Eden and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all these very Jewish stories that were part of the Jewish Torah. And so I had to ask myself, why is a non-Jewish person telling me about the God of the Jews? And then it occurred to me that through Jesus Christ, God, the God of Israel, has revealed himself to the non-Jewish people of the world that he was indeed the true God and that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. This all just sort of flooded into my perception or I just sort of, I'm not sure if you could say mentally assented to the idea or I just became uh, intrinsically aware of it, but that conviction was just generated within me and that's very much biblical. Uh, the Bible talks about how the Spirit opens the eyes of the blind and allows us to see Christ for who he is. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't give myself any credit. It's not because I'm a very intelligent person or because of any training, the, theological training I'd had. It's just the Spirit literally just revealed this to me. And that's, that's what the Bible talks about. Uh, I'm just curious how much of the movie was actually lined up with what really happened of Emily Rose. 
Oh, um, in my in my research, there actually was a court case. So I'm not sure if you know the story, but there was a priest who was tried for uh, second or third degree murder or, or negligence, something like that, for an exorcism in which the patient actually died uh, for reasons one or the other. I think I've seen pictures of the actual Emily Rose. Uh, I think you can find them if my memory serves. If this has been years since I've looked into it. It's really a non-issue for me. Whether or not the story is true is essentially irrelevant. That's just the mechanism by which I, I came across Dr. Kent Hovind's videos. Uh, I would say, though, that, that there definitely was a court case and there definitely was a attempted exorcism and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, as for a percentage of what amount is true or not, I, I can't say. It is, it is a Hollywood film, and that needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Has uh, becoming a Christian had a significant impact on your life? Yes, in every in every respect. Well, how do your your parents feel about your faith? Is is their opinion very important to you? Uh, no, it, their opinion on it's not important because they're they're dissenters. They they certainly disagree with me. Um, first and foremost, because I mean, I have to make a distinction between my mom and my dad. Uh, because they, they both have different spiritual views. My dad is, at this point, a uh, complete atheist, or at least he professes himself to be an atheist, so it wouldn't matter if I was a Christian or a rabbi. I mean, we've had this uh, discussion before. Because I come from a Jewish family, there is a certain stigma which comes from just uh, the relationship within the Jewish community. Uh, for a Jewish man to have a Christian son within a Jewish community uh, is is very shameful to to the Jewish community. So uh, there's there's that respect, and there's also just the the theological, which is he he just doesn't uh, aff he doesn't affirm belief in God. So it doesn't matter if I believe in Judaism or Christianity or Islam or anything. He he will not. This is my dad. I'm speaking of. He he will not uh, agree with me on that. As for my mother, she's what I would call a spiritualist, a very New Ager type thinker, which is all spiritual truths are true, none of them are exclusive, and yet at the same time, don't bother her about it. She doesn't want to know one way or the other and has no interest in, in reading up or doing research. So it's sort of this, I get to decide for myself what to believe and don't, don't tell me otherwise. So two very different camps, uh, both equally um, as offended, I suppose, at, at, the, at the gospel, which does claim exclusivity. Do you, do you think you'll ever... This persuade your family members to consider taking the path that you've taken? I, I'm reading a book right now called Taking the Gospel Home, and one of the first things and something uh, I've had to learn, too, and I've already sort of said is no one gets convinced to become a Christian uh, because they're, they're, they're smart or because they're, they're intellectually persuaded. I mean, if belief in God was uh, exclusive to intellectual persuasion, we'd only expect the elite, the extremely intelligent people, to, to discover Christ is their Lord, when it's the exact opposite. What God does is he reveals his Son to those whom he prepares. Uh, it, it's totally a work of God. So I can't persuade anyone of anything. All I can do is preach the truth, and if their heart is not hardened towards God, if God is working on them, uh, they will come to the knowledge of the truth. And so my job is just to be a, a living testimony and a witness to the gospel in the hope that one day God will grant them repentance, which is exactly what the Bible says. What is what is prayer and how important is it? What is prayer and how important is it? Yes. Well, uh, I think we could take a hint from Jesus, who himself is in very nature God, and when he was on earth, he was constantly in prayer. And so if God in human flesh needs to be constantly in prayer, I think that probably indicates that we who are much less than him all the more need it, and Jesus would stress that. So the importance is is vital. In fact, um, I'm not sure who said it, but I do remember the quote. He said, the quintessential human act, the thing that differentiates a human being from an animal, is the act of prayer, because that is the moment in which we detach ourselves from the physical world, which we're constantly engaged in, and we pause for a moment to reflect on the spiritual reality in which we participate. So one thing I can't stand is when I'm sitting at a dinner table, and everyone gets served their food, and they just start digging in like, uh, like my pet cat, who I just you put food in front of him, and he just starts chowing down, not, not pausing for a moment to give thanks or even to acknowledge the one from whom this, this bounty of food has come. And so prayer is the quintessential human act. It is the act that defines us as human beings. Very important. What is meant by the term God's law? I mean, what, what, is, what does that mean, God's law? Well, the, the, the Hebrew word for law is Torah, and that can mean commandment, 
So one could, I mean, God's obviously given commandments in the Bible. One illustration would be God commanded Noah to build an ark. So in a, in a sense, you could say that that's a law or a commandment given to Noah, but that doesn't mean that I have to build an ark because that commandment was not given to me. It was given to Noah. And even, even though it was given to Noah, once he built the ark, that commandment expired. God didn't expect him to keep building the ark once it was completed. And so uh, the reason I say that is because often people say, well, there's certain laws in the Old Testament, and yet they're no longer in effect in the New Testament. Isn't that a contradiction? And the answer is no, because the commandments given to Israel in the Old Testament were only given to Israel, and they actually had an expiration date uh, as per Jeremiah chapter 31, which talks about the New Covenant, which Jesus gave in the New Testament. So God's commandments or God's laws are very contextual. You need to make, make sure that whatever he's commanding is directed towards you and, and that you understand um, the, the full context in which, in which it was given. So a commandment or a law. Now, the other alternative to a commandment, or uh, which would be, a, I suppose, a moral law or a moral imperative, those would be things like, you know, God saying, thou shalt not murder. That's a law, and that, that is applicable to everyone. So there is a distinction between uh, a general commandment, a specific commandment of God, and then the moral law of God. Hey, I'm going to ask you a really controversial question. I enjoy those. Go ahead. Okay. Um, is, well, is a two-part question. Is, is abortion murder, and do you support a woman's right to choose? Uh, okay, abortion is murder. I, I believe that wholeheartedly. And do I support her right to choose? Uh, you know, the whole thing about rights, when we talk about human rights, the first question is where do rights come from? Uh, do rights come from humans or do, do rights come from God? And depending on whether or not you're a humanist or, or from my perspective, a Christian, is going to depend on how you answer that question. However, I would criticize the, the humanist view in saying that human rights come from humans because, well, then what you can do, you can really give a right to, to justify anything if humanity has the ability to grant anyone the right to do anything. So if we want to grant Hitler the right to kill Jews, well, humanly speaking, we can grant him that right. But that doesn't make it right if we grant him that right. And so we first need to go to God. We need an ultimate authority which transcends humanity to dictate which, you know, which actions are morally just or unjust. And from that point, we can then uh, determine whether something is right or wrong or whether we have the right to do it or not. And the Bible is very clear uh, that children or unborn children, which are still considered children, when, uh, when John the Baptist was in his mother's womb as what they would consider a, a fetus or a, you know, as a baby, he, he was still called a child. It said the child leapt in the womb. So it is a child, and murdering or aborting a child is, is murder. Okay. Do you think America should abolish the death penalty? That's, uh, you know, I was watching TV uh, not so long ago, and uh, who was it? Uh, one, uh, one, a Christian speaker, at least uh, many people think he's a Christian speaker, uh, Joel Osteen, yes, that's his name. He was asked to weigh in on that issue, and he was very hesitant to give an answer, and he kept sort of averting it to say, you know, we should, you should ask other people, people who are more involved in understanding all, all that. I think the death penalty in certain cases could be justified, and whenever I see, you know, either on TV or in a movie, the death penalty being, um, you know, given, uh, there is always, you know, that they're they're asked, do you want a priest to come in or a minister to come in and talk to you before you go through with this? And so I think if we're going to administer the death penalty, what we should first, I mean, this is I'm t talking from a Christian perspective. If, if I was uh, you know, are ruling in on the matter, I'd say present them with the gospel. If they have committed a heinous, heinous crime, show no signs of repentance, and the death penalty is, is necessary in some capacity, uh, I would say preach the gospel to that person so that they have an opportunity to be saved and then, and then execute, but not, not before. Um, that would be my... Now, obviously, the death penalty is not applicable in all cases. I think there, there are probably extreme cases where it would be... Uh, where, where, where it would be understandable, but uh, I don't see it also as the prescribed method in the New Testament. We even see, under Old Testament law, uh, an adulterer, someone caught in the act of adultery, was to be stoned, and yet Jesus relaxed that commandment and uh, and showed the way of mercy. So we can extend mercy to lawbreakers where wherever it, it we're able to do so, and we should with the gospel. 
Uh, and yet, if there is no signs of repentance, and if they're at absolute danger to society and to everyone around them, uh, maybe in certain cases, extreme cases, it would be necessary. Well, how do you explain uh, Mr. Osteen's hesitancy? Why do you think that made him uncomfortable? I think Joel Osteen uh, has a reputation, for, for better or for worse, and he, he probably avoids certain controversies in order that he doesn't get blacklisted or he doesn't offend the wrong people. Um, He's very much the kind of person that wants to make everyone happy. He, he doesn't want to offend anyone. So certain issues like that, he'll just say he won't weigh in on it just to avoid falling on one side of the fence or the other. Let me ask you this. Is America a, a Christian nation? No. There is no such thing as a Christian nation. Jesus said that himself. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. So a Christian nation would essentially be a Christian kingdom where the leadership is Christian, is being obedient to God, where their laws are, in, are always enforcing the attitudes and in obedience to God, and that, that simply is not the case. Uh, so, no. Well, could there be such a thing? There will be when Jesus returns. Uh, even if our government and everyone in power was a Christian, it still would not be a Christian nation because the general public is not Christian. So just because the leadership is doing the right thing doesn't mean the populace is and so a Christian nation properly understood will not be a reality until Christ returns. Should prayer be allowed in public schools? Absolutely. I, I mean I could elaborate on that, but I mean yes, absolutely it should be. Okay. But at the same time you support um you don't have a problem with uh, a, a secular a secularist state. Uh secularism I mean, what are your general thoughts? So well, I think the secular, the word secular, I think, has been abducted. Uh, it was coined by St. Augustine, who was a Christian. His definition of the secular, which is really where the idea comes from, was that a secular, uh, the secular was, is where the church and the state meet. And the church is obviously the body of Christians, and the state is just uh, unbelievers or participants in a, in a particular society. The secular would be the middle ground where Christians and non-Christians can participate without offending each other or being offensive to God. So, for example, something that would be secular would be going to the food store and buying food. That, that neither has religious or anti-religious connotations. That's something that Christians and non-Christians both can participate in. So it's not sinful or un it's just it's totally neutral. That's the secular. And so in a secular place, Christians and non-Christians can go about their business without uh, threatening each other. And I don't see Christian prayer in a secular institution being threatening to an atheist. They, they don't have to participate. Right. Um, okay, so America is not a Christian nation. Uh, is it a sinful nation? Uh, every nation on earth has sin. Uh, is the nation itself, I mean... Well, God, are, wait, okay, go ahead. Would you say all nations are equally sinful? No, no, I, I certainly would not. The fact that America supports Israel, I, I suspect, is one of the reasons God has blessed America with a great deal of prosperity. Uh, and yet, when that, I mean, the Bible is clear. When you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. If you curse Israel, you'll be cursed. And you can see how that works out um, in history and even in contemporary times. So I think that is in a large part uh, how God views the nations, how he deals with the nations, is, is how they deal with Israel. Uh, and America has, not, not always, and I, I think some of their policies are moving in the direction of becoming antagonistic towards Israel, but they have in, in many ways been Israel's ally. And I, I think for that reason, God has blessed America. As we withdraw support, uh, I think we're going to begin to see uh, judgment and we're going to see the decay of American society and culture. What do you think about Israel's uh, current leadership, um, when you say America needs to support Israel, does that mean just you give them the green light on whatever they do? I mean, no, 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 no. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm not really a very political thinker. I, I don't really care what governments are doing because I understand that all governments are human institutions that need to, that will eventually fall and be replaced with God's kingdom. That is what the Bible teaches. And yet Israel as a 
not as a government, but as a people, the people of Israel, the Jewish people who inhabit that land, who have the rights to inheritance and all that, they're being threatened by people who do not believe the promises of God, who do not believe they're the chosen people, or that that land belongs to them. So to whatever degree Israel is defending their right to the promises of God, and to whatever degree their antagonists are trying to thwart the promises of God, or, or trying to antagonize Israel to give up land or to... Uh, to invade Israel, that is where uh, is, uh, American support comes in. That's where Israel's right to the land comes in, and that's where, and, and that's sort of what I'm arguing. I'm not saying everything the Israeli government does is right. I don't even know what they're doing. I, I don't really care. Uh, I'm not sure even what all the American government's doing in terms of its policies, policies for Israel. I just know the general principle is that the Jews belong in the land of Israel. They have a right to it. They have a right to not be antagonized there, and that's, that's what God said. And, and to that degree, that's how God uh, will judge the nations, is how they uh, respect what God has already said, which is the Jews belong in the land of Israel. That's their land. Have you been there? Have you visited? Uh, no, uh, no, but uh, we're all going to end up there one day at the resurrection. So whenever people ask me, am I planning to go to Israel, I say yes, and I'll see you there. Okay. I heard you say in a video once that, relatively recently, I think, that, and I, I, I didn't really understand it, so I'll, I'll ask you here. You said the Bible quote was something to the effect of sin is sin, I and mean, whether it's a murder or a lie, all sin is the same. Now, what am I supposed to do with a verse like that? Because the implications of interpreting it literally are troubling to me. Okay, well, interpret it literally. Tell me why it's troubling, and then we'll talk about it. It would be like, it would be taking, in other words, it would be like saying that taking the Lord's name in vain is just as bad as killing someone. Okay, and so that's troubling to you how? Because I see killing someone as far worse than uh, using a word you're not supposed to. Okay, worse to who? Well, you're taking a life. Um, that has to be the ultimate sin. Well, okay, first of all, in, think about it from God's perspective. If you kill someone, has God really lost that life? Well, uh, you know, I... I, I mean, has, I it slipped through, has it slipped through his fingers? Is he unable to recover it? Is he unable to resurrect it? Yeah, but I'm very uncomfortable with that line of thinking. Um, sure. Okay. Well, then let's just take it to where the Bible wants to take it, because there is, because if you take it the wrong way, what that really sounds like is well, then that's what it's doing is it's taking something like murder and making it less of a sin. When when it's it's quite it's meant to do the exact opposite. It's meant to make all sin un unbelievably horrifying. It's meant to make it more horrific than we can even comprehend. When it says in the book of James, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. That's, the, that's James 2.10. That's the verse that I quoted. What it's saying is this. God is perfect, and any imperfection is absolutely intolerable to him because of the degree to which he is holy. So it's not saying that God doesn't recognize that a lie doesn't have the same consequences as, as you know mass genocide. Obviously, there's a difference, and the Bible even teaches that there are degrees of punishment. He says it'll be worse in that day for Sodom and Gomorrah or for you than for, than for this because of that. So there are degrees of punishment. But the point of that verse, the book of James, is to point out that you may think you're a good person, but if you've even broken one aspect of God's law, God sees you as a sinner and you're deserving of judgment and the wages of sin is death. Now, the worst sin in the Bible... The worst sin in the Bible, I mean, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. So really the, the most sinful thing you can do besides breaking God's laws and commandments, which any, you know, any sin really uh, uh, the basis is, but really the ultimate sin is not living up to the expectation for which God has made you, which is we are to reflect, we are to be the images of God. I mean... Uh, one one pastor preached a sermon once, and this is a wonderful illustration. In in ancient cities, if there was a king, the king would actually have a uh, you know like a mold, like a clay statue made of himself, and put it in the city. So when people look at the statue, they're reminded of you know who owns the place, who's the king. 
And that's exactly what man is. Man is meant to be a physical representation, an image of God. And so when we sin, we're taking our rightful place, which is to be the image of God, the very purpose for our existence, and when we sin, what we're doing is we're saying, I mean, we're going from being uh, a being that's meant to bring glory to God to, to a being that now brings dishonor to him, that, that muddies his image, that reflects poorly on who he is. In fact, it even when we sin, it, it lies about who God is. If I murder, if I, if I rape, if I do these evil things, and I'm made in the image of God, well, then I'm lying about God. And so it's all about, it's all about you know, do you have a man-centered view of, of sin, or do you have a God-centered view of sin? And a God-centered view of sin says that all sin is an absol absolute disruption of the image of God for which we were made in the very purpose for our existence. And that's why all sin is infinitely offensive to God because it destroys the very purpose for which he made it for which he made us okay um, well I'll just move on sure I, I, mean, I hope I answered that adequately uh, you know when when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit you know they disobeyed one commandment they, they took a bite of a fruit that didn't seem to hurt anyone some would say and yet God cast them out of the garden and subjected them to death he said the wages of sin is death you deserve to die for disobeying me and, and Christ had to die for that sin so that, I mean, the seriousness of sin, any sin, no matter how little we think it is, all sin is infinitely offensive to God. So but you can understand my, my line of thinking, too, I mean, sure. because surely Christianity is not saying that aborting a baby is no worse than stealing a pack of gum. No, what, we, what we're saying is stealing a pack of gum is as bad as aborting a baby, because both are infinitely sinful to God. We're not saying that the consequences are the same. Obviously, one has to do with affecting another life, and God may yet treat that far more harshly. And yet, we can't also ignore the fact that stealing, whether it's big or small, lying, whether it's big or small, is infinitely offensive to God. And we all, for this reason, need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This all goes back to him. It goes to recognizing that the wage of sin is death, and that we require something, someone, that is Christ, to die for us for you know, many people will defend themselves and say, all I've ever done is stolen a pack of gum and told small lies. I've never aborted a baby or done any of those things. You still need the sacrifice. That's, that's really the point of what the book of James is pointing out. Now, you brought up Adam and Eve. Sure. I'm curious. The, do you believe that the instruction not to eat the fruit from that tree... Was that more of a uh, a test, or were there something inherently wrong about eating that fruit? The, the fruit was as normal as any other fruit. It had no magical properties. If God had created a button and said, don't push it, it would have had the same effect. The point is, man was made to be uh, a reflection of the image of God and also subject to God, and so giving them a, essentially, I don't want to use the word arbitrary because it's anything but arbitrary, but the point is, God gave them a commandment, and this, the command was simply just don't disobey it. Mm -hmm. Just obey me at, you know, at all times. That, that really is the point. And giving them the option to disobey, I often say, is really what we do when we, uh, when we want to marry someone, when we want to be with someone. If we love someone and say, you know, will you be with me forever, we always give them the option of saying no. That's the point of asking the question. There, there's this autonomous freedom that you know love needs to uh, allow in order for love to be free. Love has to be chosen for it to have any value. And man, to have a relationship with God, must of necessity have the option to opt out of the relationship. Otherwise, the relationship has no value. Otherwise, it's not chosen. So I see that as God's way of just saying, man, I'm, I've provided a way for you to be with me, but if you don't, Go your own way, and that's that's what God has done. Well, what is the significance of, and, and perhaps some people read too much into this, but what is the significance of calling it the tree of knowledge? Well, that's not the full name. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Prior to man's uh, disobedience to God, man had no concept of evil experientially. Man would not sit around the garden thinking about murder and rape and all the things that you know we read in the newspaper daily because those weren't part of the world in which he inhabited and it wasn't even part of his consciousness because man up until that point was an undefiled being so you know inwardly outwardly and in the creation 
all there was was obedience to God and the glory of God and just perfection until the moment in which they sinned, which then brought them into what is called the knowledge of good and evil. Now they're presented with not just the good, but the evil too. And so that's where, you know, murder, rape, and all these, the first thing they realized, which was essentially the, the deceitfulness of sin, was that they were that they were naked. Now, God asked them, who told you that you were naked? They were made to be that way. We were made to be naked and unashamed. And so once they, dis they ate this fruit, they realized they were naked, not because they were, uh, you know, that anything changed in their physiology. They were naked before and they're naked after, but now they're ashamed of their natural state. They defiled their natural state of being and became perverse, which is why they became ashamed of each other. And so that, that's really what the knowledge of good and evil is, it's the introduction of evil into the creation. So it's not just now you only know good, now you also know good and evil. The knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the snake was Satan, correct? Yes, that's what the book of Revelation says. Okay. Um, I'm not someone who can recite all the Ten Commandments. Um, is that something you have memorized? Yes. Is convincing people to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, is that something that should be done in a very serious way or a very frivolous, lighthearted way? Uh, I think you know the answer to that question. Uh, obviously, with absolute sobriety, soberness, and, and seriousness. So, I mean, granted, when you're relating to a person, you've got to be real with them. And depending if you have sort of a... I don't know, a casual relationship or something a little more intimate, I mean, you can use a different tone of voice, but the fact of the matter is, when we're talking about people's eternity, I mean, this is what the gospel is, is your eternal existence and your well-being depends on your reaction to this, this very truth. I mean, obviously, we need to present that with seriousness, and how we present it isn't just a matter of our tone of voice, but how we live our lives as well, as a witness to these people. Should Christians feel a sense of duty or obligation to... Spread the word of God? Uh, yes, it is the commission of the church. That's why we're still on earth. When Jesus prayed with the disciples in the Gospel of John, he prayed, do not take them out of the world, but keep them in the world. We're here for a reason, for a purpose. And he said, just as the Father sent me, I send you. And that's that message is speaking to the church as a whole. So, Christians, the reason you've been given the Gospel, the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. And if you know the gospel, you do have an obligation for sharing it with the, you know, within the realm of influence that you have. Now, that doesn't mean everyone needs to be, um, uh, you know, on YouTube like I am or, or doing what, you know, some of the great preachers out there reaching millions of people. But we all know people in our lives, and we each and every day have the opportunity to share the gospel with people, and we, we do need to take advantage of it. I read the title of a book that says one thing you can't do in heaven and I didn't bother reading the whole book because I, I got the point and the point is this this is your only opportunity to share the gospel with people and see people get saved right now and so take take every opportunity and I think many people will be both ashamed and um, and just weep bitterly recognizing that they had all this opportunity to, to help people save people and and they didn't do you believe God is still sending us prophets and apostles? No. I, I believe he, he is just building his church and that we are all, each and all of us are called to, though, you know, not, we're, on the, we're not all pastors, we're, we're not all teachers, but every member of the church, the, reason, the way we enter the church is that we, we hear and understand the gospel. So we're all being sent as, uh, we are all here to continue the mission that Jesus started which is to proclaim the gospel in the kingdom of God. We are all here to do that, without exception. How important is it, in your opinion, for people to interpret the word of God correctly? Well, the Bible commands us to do so. It says to search the scriptures diligently. It says rightly divide the word of truth. and Do not be a workman that needs to be ashamed. So, I mean, and especially in today's world where, you know, we're, we're mostly literate uh, in uh, Western culture. Most people can read. And if you can't read, you can at least have access to audio files and teachings or go to church. None of us really have an excuse for not being in the know 
uh, and, and how to interpret the Bible, how to read it or understand its general message, and, and get that out there. I mean, there, there's no excuse for that. What, what percentage of people would you say correctly interpret the Bible the first time they read any given verse? Oh, I mean, I, I don't know if I could give a percentage of that, but um, I'd say if you're a genuinely spirit-filled Christian reading your Bible diligently, you may not come to the right interpretation immediately, but at the same time, I would also say that you are in every position to get to the right interpretation eventually. That's, that's the role of the Spirit. That's what he does. And so every Christian has access to the right interpretation via the Spirit. So the job of a preacher is to say, okay, here's a verse from the Bible, and it's my job to tell you what it means. I would say that's one of his jobs. It's definitely the, the, the job of those who take a teaching position, having been well-seasoned in the Word of God, having spent many years in it. And yes, it is their job to get in front of the, the community of, of believers and help those who are less developed, who, have, who are less studied than them. It is their job to give a proper interpretation. And if they don't, the Bible says there is a greater judgment for, for teachers who, who, who mislead people and teach falsely. When it comes to questions of right or wrong, should people just go with their gut, or would you say it's always important to turn to the Bible to determine whether or not something is a sin? Say a woman or man, for that matter, dress in a very sexually provocative way. Does, does the Bible say that's a sin, or can we dress however we want to? No, it, it does say we need to dress modestly because we can cause other people around us to stumble or have impure thoughts due to our behavior or our dress code and other things. And so when the Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, what we need to recognize is that we are always going to attempt to justify certain behaviors that we are attracted to, which are part of the sin nature and the flesh, when the Bible says these things are wrong. So we always need to be ready and willing to say, you know what, even if I want to do this, before I do it, what does the Bible have to say about it? And if the Bible is silent on a particular issue, one that comes up pretty often in private messages is video games. If the Bible doesn't talk about video really? games, and obviously it couldn't, it didn't have video games back then, but the principles, the principles by which, you know, what makes something acceptable to God or not are laid down pretty clearly. And so what you do is you take the general principles and you apply them to the video game, and you can then make a determination whether or not this is glorifying to God or not. That, so that's a good way to go about it. Um, have you personally struggled with the meaning of various verses within the Bible? Oh, sure. Uh, I actually have a few that I'm, I'm still mulling over, and uh, I don't think we're totally going to you know, grasp the entire thing. There's so much complexity and depth to the Word of God, uh, and so I, I, have, I have certain questions, you know, I still go back and forth when I'm reading Thessalonians, where it talks about the day of the Lord and the rapture. I, I'd like to know the exact timing of it. Uh, I still hold to a pre-tribulationist view, and I will until we enter the tribulation, then I'll switch my position. It's, it's tenable at least until then. So yeah, there are certain things which I'm not 100% clear on. I mean, I know what it's teaching about. It's obviously talking about the rapture and the tribulation and the time of the end, so that, that's not up for dispute, but the timing is not exactly spoken of clearly, and it's ambiguous, and, so, and I think that's intentional for a reason. So, yeah, there are certain things in the Bible that I don't think I will, uh, maybe I will have a better interpretation, if that's the right word, or understanding of it before uh, I mean, these events take place, but I don't know. You mentioned the rapture. How do you explain preachers... Uh, you know, they did in 1900, they did back in 1800. What is it about people like, say, Harold Camping, sure. who seem utterly convinced that the rapture is, you know, like, next month? Um, yeah. What, what is, is this, this can't be God telling this to them. Well, no, it can't be, because the Bible is clear, no man knows the day or the hour. That's an exact quote from the Bible. So if no man knows the day or the hour, and Harold Camping is a man, and he's claiming to know the day and the hour, then there's something wrong with that. And where did he get his date from? I mean, it's just, he, he never made it clear. He, he, he obviously didn't get it from the Bible, so he must have either gotten it from uh, some mathematical equation that he came out. I don't know. I don't know what he did, but, but it certainly wasn't from that. Shouldn't he know better than that at his age? Shouldn't he know better? Uh, yes. Did he know better? Uh, I, 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 I'd like to think so. I don't know. I mean, there are... I mean, this is, this is how cults begin. You have someone who claims to know what the Bible is all about. Maybe he sat under teachers who were every bit as deceived as he was. 
and they start going off on these uh, unbiblical rabbit trails that lead them down a, a path that is just simply uh, ridiculous. And so I don't know what path he went on. I don't know how he arrived at those conclusions, but he certainly could have known better had he just read his Bible. Do you find any parts of the Bible contradictory? I would say this. I have read in the Bible certain things that at first glance have uh, made me pause and say, you know what, how, does, how do I reconcile this with this? But I come to the Bible with certain uh, presuppositions that this is the Word of God. God has shown me through my six, seven years of being a Christian that His Word is reliable. And so when I come to something like that, I've learned to trust that there is an answer, and in most, if not all cases, with just enough due diligence, which usually doesn't take very long, there is a way to reconcile it, either because someone has already done that and you can just do your research on the Internet or otherwise. I mean, so-called Bible contradictions have been contested and talked about and debated for hundreds of years, and most of them are not new, the ones that people typically come up with today, and they have been dealt with for hundreds and hundreds of years. You just need to know where to look to find the answer. So I've learned to trust God when I, when I, I find something like that, and frankly, I, I find less and less now, and I, I honestly can't think of any at the moment that are nagging me. Uh, I've been able to reconcile pretty much every one that I've come across. Do you think God likes the fact that there are so many different denominations of the Christian church? No, God doesn't want the church to be divided. In, a certain, in certain cases, denominations are necessary, because what you have is one group of people... Uh, splintering from another group of people saying you're being unbiblical. So denominations are created out of a desire to be more biblical, and in some cases they're right, and in some cases they're wrong. And so certain denominations that splintered off did so for biblical reasons. They said, you know what, what this group that we're participating in believes right now is not biblical. We're going to splinter off and start a new denomination that corrects this issue. And I think that's absolutely right. We should be doing that. And yet, at the same time, this compounds and, you know, it sort of weaves a web of uh, eventually what you have is all these denominations and uh, many denominations that should be getting along aren't just because they have a different name, even though they agree on pretty much everything. And so I think it would be cool if denominations got together and actually made doctrinal statements and said which ones are in and which ones are out and sort of began to melt the walls between them. I, I think it's possible. I just don't see any examples example of some of the ones you say that should be getting along. Oh, I can also give examples of ones that shouldn't be getting along. So the whole Protestant-Catholic split, I think, was absolutely justified because the Catholic Church is ungodly and unbiblical in essentially every area. And so the Protestant Reformation was absolutely necessary. And yeah, that's a denomination, I guess, but absolutely necessary. And they, so that, they should not be getting along. No, they shouldn't because the issues for which they split are actual issues. The Protestants split from the Catholic Church because they said, what you are doing is unbiblical and we're going to fix that in our, you know, in our circle or sphere of influence, in our denomination, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And so the Protestant Reformation, I saw that as a move back towards <coughs> biblical Christianity, and that was justified. So I'm just trying to think, in terms of the ones you say should be getting along. Oh, sure. Um, Baptist with uh, Protestant... Well, Baptists are Protestants, so I guess it would be like Baptists with Episcopalians and Lutherans. And Now, there are problems. I mean, when you talk about the Baptist denomination, there's also, you know, so many divisions within the Baptist. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not as joint. So I, I, just, was, I was baptized in a Southern Baptist church. Okay, fair enough. And I, I attend a Baptist church. So, And if I was to enter into your Southern Baptist church, would I expect it to be exactly the same as, as the church in which I go? No. I mean, local churches, you go from one to another the main doctrines will pr likely, if they're being biblical, be the same and then have little traditions and whatnot mixed in there. So I, I don't know. I don't know if what I'm saying is realistic or not. I, I just think that we could have far more unity within the body with, between denominations than, than we have at the moment if we would just lay our uh, traditions aside and, and just get back to what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. How important is, is the Bible itself to the act of spreading the Word of God? I mean, I would imagine, well... Well, had you got a, a large part of the Bible memorized? Like, could I recite the Gospel of John right now if I needed to? Yeah. Uh, no, I couldn't recite it word for word. I can go through it pretty much, you know. I can bring to mind uh, every, not every instance from the Gospel of John, but pretty much summarize it 
if I had to. So I'd say a lot of the Bible I can summarize or give you the general idea behind any particular book in the Bible and, and what, it, what it intends to preach. But no, I, I wouldn't say I, I've even come close to memorizing it. But would you recommend every Christian own at least one physical copy of the Bible? Of course. I mean, that's their, that's their guide. I mean, I can't imagine a Christian... When I first became a Christian, no one had to tell me, go get a Bible. I knew I needed one. So, In terms of the Gospels, uh, and we talked a little bit about contradictions before. Sure. I guess I was in high school when I really started to research... And I thought, okay, wait, these these four um, Gospels are, are basically telling the same story, but just slightly different versions. Right. And that kind of, uh, that troubled me a little bit. Cause I sure. Thought, which, uh, which one of these versions am I supposed to, you know where I'm going with this. Right. And then the answer, biblically, is God says out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, every, everything will be established. So God didn't just have one of the disciples testify and write down the gospel and, and, and codify it, and that's it. He gave four distinct gospels, which are complementary, not contradictory, from four different perspectives, which show the integrity of... Of the message. I mean, imagine, and you've probably heard this example before, you've got four witnesses to an event. These people go away for some time, they write down their particular perspective, and it all comes back together. Now, apparent discrepancies between the accounts is expected if you've got four different perspectives. If they all were word for word exactly the same, you would, you would accuse them of conspiring together. You know, they all got together and say, well, write this exactly as I'm writing this, and on and on it goes. And that's simply not the case with how the Gospels were written. Now, there are the synoptic Gospels, which clearly uh, share certain content. So some people posit a Q document that Mark, Luke, and Matthew all used, and that, that's possible, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And yet each of them deliberately, it's obviously very deliberately, added information to their own unique accounts because that is the information that was uh, eyewitness to whoever, you know, each of the Gospels is linked to. To, directly to one of the disciples. So Mark is linked to uh, Matthew, John is obviously to, or excuse me, Mark is to Peter, uh, Matthew to uh, Matthew, the tax collector. Luke goes back to uh, uh, Paul because Luke was a companion of Paul and he's giving sort of a summary account of many things. And then the Gospel of John comes to us by Polycarp, who is a, a friend or a, a disciple of John. So mm -hmm. each of those accounts are a unique perspective on the gospel. It's the same story with incredible integrity between uh, the four of them, and yet each contributes something that the other does not have. And so you've got this sort of this tapestry in which people are reporting on the person of Christ, each authentically but uniquely, and that's and that's important. I, I find it interesting some of the little details that only appear in say one gospel, like the detail of uh, the Romans saying you know, that this is truly. The Son of God. That's only in one gospel, correct? Right, yep. And in terms of... Can you speak a moment of how you feel about the gospel of Luke in particular? I, I've sure. read that it's the, the most sympathetic to the Romans, that particular gospel. Sympath I mean, I, I suppose some of the Jews would consider uh, Jesus a Roman sympathizer just because he wasn't a, a religious zealot who was trying to free Israel from their, their oppression. Um, Luke, Luke's account is unique in the Gospels. It is part of the synoptic tradition, so it has similarities, but uh, it's also the most, I, I suppose if you want to call it sympathetic, towards women. There's the most stories with women in the Gospel of Luke. So you've got you know, the, the woman with the issue of bleeding, and you've got a whole bunch of stories with, with unique, unique stories about women in, in the Gospel. And so Jesus is neither, I mean, if you just read the Gospel, he's clearly a Jew. I mean, that, that's unavoidable, as he is in the other Gospels. And he, he, he just does not feel threatened by the Romans, because part of his message is this, this, this Gospel, the Kingdom of God, is not just for the Jews, but it's for the Gentiles, it's for the Greeks, it's for the Romans as well. And, and that, I mean, that's part of the Old Testament as well. We read... In Isaiah chapter 49, that the Messiah the, was meant to bring 
the light of God's salvation to the Gentiles, which are non-Jewish people. So I just see whatever happened in Luke as the fulfillment of the mission that was already foretold in the Jewish scriptures, which is the Messiah would come and actually be a light not just to the Jews, but to the, the Gentiles, the Romans as well. Do you, do you have a problem with people who like to find out as much as they can about the historical Jesus. Um, there, there's been a lot of uh, research into that subject. Do you think that's helpful, or should people avoid that? It's, it's helpful, I guess, based on your, your agenda. I mean, if you're going into the so-called historical Jesus uh, mission, movement, whatever you want to call it, with the intention of saying that there's a discrepancy, discrepancy between the Gospels and the so-called historical Jesus, well, then I'd say your agenda is wrong, because really the only information that we have about Jesus is from the Gospels. That is the historical Jesus. So this whole historical Jesus thing, which usually I think of the Jesus uh, seminar when, when I think of this, the whole thing's been discredited. It's all just a bunch of baloney. But um, I have no problem with people looking at the Gospels and trying to affirm what you can using the disciplines of historical science and say which of these can be verified or which can't. But at the same time, I also think it's fruitless because you're either going to believe the Gospels or you're not. If you come to it in disbelief with the agenda of saying this is not true, this is not true, I don't think you can do that from a historical science point of view either. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you can only do that if you're, you have your presuppositions that say this is not true. Now, if you're a Christian and you go into it saying this is true, and now let's see what, what history can verify, I think you're going to be pretty impressed with some of the findings. Yeah, and, you know, there are questions that are, you know, I can understand why people are legitimately interested, like the, uh, the question of the cross itself. I mean, was it, what was the cross itself? What did it look like? Sure. Were the nails through the wrist or through the hand? Um, yeah, and that's and that's interesting and uh, and fascinating. I, I you know I, I'm curious about that myself. But frankly, because the Bible doesn't describe the shape of the cross, other than the fact that the word cross seems to indicate you know a you know a cross. So uh, you know I just see it as irrelevant. I mean, it's just not a it's not a detail that's going to change anything. But do you ever find yourself thinking about um, the early Christians and the people who actually wrote? the Gospels. I mean, Christianity, uh, I mean, would it have been harder or easier back then to be a Christian? I guess a lot harder. They didn't really I even would say, I would say it's a little bit of both. It's, it's harder in the sense that uh, they were being persecuted. They were being killed. It was an illegal religion to the Jews. and it was, I mean, and also keep in mind who the Gospel was first preached to. It was first preached to Jewish people. So within a Jewish community, this was extremely taboo. You were under threat of death, um, and then there was the Roman occupation. There's just so many factors. Really, it was a you know it was a fight for your life, mm -hmm. and yet at the same time it was easier in a sense because some of the objections. I mean, here we are, two thousand years removed. So we've got this whole atheist movement, and we've got these so-called higher critics, and we've got all these things to worry about. Those would not have been concerns of people two thousand years ago. When someone said the tomb of Jesus is empty, they could have gone to the tomb and said, "You know what? You're right." So it, it's easier in one sense, in the sense that they were closer to the event and didn't have all these sort of so-called sophisticated objections, and yet at the same time it's harder for them because they're also under the threat of all these political, religious, com communal um, you know, uh, objections or uh, obstacles or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, I, I find it fascinating. I mean, we'll never know for sure, but immediately after the crucifixion, what, what, the, were, what, what were those years really like, those, those first 30 years? Um, you ever think about that? Uh, all, all we really have are the is the Book of Acts, which really does sum up many years of church existence. And I think you can get a pretty good idea of what it looked like. Christianity was just this very quiet. It wasn't mil uh, military. It wasn't. Um, it almost wasn't even political. It really was just this underground movement of people coming to faith, recognizing who Jesus was, and it just spreading into communities. People just. Uh, not building church buildings, but just bodies of believers who would begin to commute or commune together, and and enjoy each other's company and worship the Lord, and just sort of this springing up and spreading from Jerusalem out into 
out into the world. And so, you know, the book of Acts documents that. Um, is it okay to to write in a Bible? You mean like sort of scribble and make yeah, notes? Underlines and highlight, stuff like that. You know, I come from a Jewish tradition, and so, you know, you come into uh, the, the temple, and you've got the Torah scroll inside, you know, a glass case, and then they bring it out, and everyone kisses it, and if there's even a little imperfection, they'll burn the whole thing and make a new one. So the, I kind I, I kind of come from a tradition where, you know, the holy books of God are, 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 are holy and not to be defiled, and yet at the same time, the Bible is not anything other... It is the Word of God, but at the same time, it's just ink on paper in, in another respect. So I, I, I don't mark up my Bibles. Um, I, I have quite a few. I'm not one really for writing notes into my Bible, and yet I respect people who do, who diligently, you know, they, they highlight stuff and they underline stuff and they want to get back to it and sort of uh, it, dig into certain... I think that's, that's very useful if you're, if you're studying and whatnot. I just I can't bring myself to do it for whatever reason. But you wouldn't consider it a a desecration. You wouldn't consider it a sin to write to underline things yeah. in the Bible. No, no, I wouldn't. Not at all. Not at all. Did you? Were you aware of the pastor? I believe his name was Terry Jones when he made a big show of burning a copy of the Koran. I remember the name. Uh, I didn't follow him or anything like that. Well, yeah, he uh, he was this this Christian preacher, small southern town, and. He made a big show of burning a copy of the Quran, and uh, yeah, it got to the point where the Department of Defense actually contacted him and said, "You know, please don't do this. This could result in some deaths of right. Jews." Yeah, it, it, definitely a really dumb thing for him to do. If you want to make a statement, I mean, Muslims on the other side of the world, you know, they burn American flags, burn Bibles, whatever. By doing the same thing in reverse, by burning their literature, what we're doing is, first of all, we're justifying their behavior. So they, they, you know, they see it and they go, okay, well, we're just going to do the same thing. And really, it just escalates. It, it doesn't solve anything. If you're going to say you know, Christianity is true and Islam is not, what you need to do is what Jesus did, is that truth is not just a demonstration of dominance in argument. It's not just a matter of brute strength. It's also a matter of lifestyle and... and and showing that the, tr the the side of truth you're on is, is confident, but it's also holy, and it's also it's right, it's righteous, and it's it's pure and it's unthreatening, and that's that's sort of what Jesus did. And he he wasn't violent. He didn't go around burning Roman bridges or Roman chariots or whatever. He 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 reached out for the, to them in, in compassion. And so had uh, Terry Jones is that his name? Yes, I believe. Yeah. If he had instead, I mean, if he had instead maybe talked about why he felt the Koran was wrong, instead of burning it, I think that could have gone a lot farther. It may not have created the media blitz and gotten him all the attention. I mean, obviously, the, the news flocks towards those people who are being louder and bigger than life and controversial and whatnot. But I think he could have been more effective uh, going about it a, a, a different way. Do you think it is a sin to, to burn a Koran? In one sense, it is just paper. I mean, if it's if it's wrong to burn, I mean, and I'd say it's is it a sin to burn a Bible? I'd say no. It it it's just a book. It's not the a end sin of the day. to burn a Bible. I, no, uh, other than what's your intention? You know, it, is it to make a statement like I'm burning God's word? I hate God. Well, that that would be a sin. But the act of burning some some paper is that itself it's a sin. No, it, it's about the heart. It's about your intention. It's about the message. You're sending, but I, I don't see Bible. I mean, the Bible says clearly that God is going to burn the entire universe, and when that happens, I'm sure a lot of Bibles are going to go up in smoke. So, no, is burning a Bible in of itself wrong? No, it's about what's your intention, what's the message, where, where's your heart at? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I, I think a lot of Christians would disagree with you, though. Um. Well, again, the reason they disagree with me is because if you're seen burning a Bible. Well, what what's that message send? And, and and it's because of the message. It's because of the message that it's a sin. I, I'd say it is a sin because of its connotations. But the actual burning itself, it's not like that paper is holy. It's not like if you burn a Bible, the world is not going to have Bible. I mean, it's just I I, I don't see. Maybe maybe I'm not articulating it as clearly as as I ought. Um, I'm not telling you the paper's not holy. And you mentioned earlier the, the Catholic Church not being holy. I, I guess you would not consider 
Uh, the holy commu- the wafers. You don't consider them to be holy? No, I don't. Okay. How do you feel about the Westboro Baptist Church? Not well. And they carry these horrible signs. And I know you you've you've mentioned them before. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I did make just a video not long ago that, where I talked about them. Is is calling someone a fag? And it's not a word I'd like to use at all. Is is, is that a sin? Is hom- is homosexuality a sin? Yes, it is. A, it is a sin to call people fags. And yes, homosexuality as a sexual practice and behavior is also a sin. But that doesn't give you the right to call them names. I mean, Jesus hung out with prostitutes. Now, is prostitution wrong? Yes. Yes, it is. Are, is prostitution sinful? Yes, it is. And yet Jesus hung out with them, not because he was endorsing their behavior, but because he was extending a hand of friendship. God was extending a hand of friendship and forgiveness to these people. And so the Westboro Baptist Church gets their jollies in condemning people. But Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to, to condemn the world. I came into the world to save the world. And I do not see that attitude in the Westboro Baptist Church. If they really were Christians, what they would do is this. They, they would not say that homosexuality is right. They wouldn't condone it. They, could, they can still say it's wrong. But at the same time, what they would do is they'd reach out to the homosexual community with the gospel of forgiveness rather than a word of judgment. And that's the difference. They seem to be very hateful people. Yes. They, like I said, they get joy, a strange, perverse kind of joy, out of judgment. I don't understand that. If, if they were forgiven people, if they really understood the grace and the mercy of God, if that was precious to them, that is what they would focus on. Mm-hmm. Some, for some reason, they're focused on on judgment, and and that's probably what they're going to get in the end. And that they seems to be what they're asking for. Extraordinary insensitivity to grieving parents who are having to bury their children. Well, I can only imagine how God's going to treat them. Um, but should Christians feel? The trepidation about telling other people that they're sinning. In other words, should Christians mind their own business, or do they have a responsibility to call out sinful behavior when they see it? It depends on, uh, first of all, are they calling out another Christian's sin? Because we're actually commanded to correct each other in the faith. So if I see a brother sinning, the Bible commands me to correct him so that I can actually help him. Uh, now, it also says to remove the uh, log out of my eye before I remo- try and remove the speck of dirt or the, you know, the splinter from your eye. The point is this. If I'm c- criticizing you for sinning, I better be sure that I'm not doing the same thing at the same time. You know, Don't be a hypocrite. So now, when I'm, I, mean, I can give an example that happened to me yesterday. I was in my workplace, and my boss started swearing uh, in conversation with me, and I was... You know, the Christian part of me wanted to say, you know what, I don't deserve to be spoken to this way. I don't appreciate you swearing in conversation with me. Uh, I don't tolerate that language. And yet, at the same time, I respected his authority over me. He is the boss. Mm -hmm. And I also realize he's not a Christian, and so nothing I say is really going to matter in this context. If I say I'm a Christian and I don't like when you use swear words, it's probably just going to cause him to swear more. He's not going to respect that. So it's also about discernment and, and wisdom and just knowing when... You know when to uh, wage the battle, or whatever the phrase right. you want you want to say. Common sense. Yeah. Um, well, someone I know, well, someone I know of, said recently that they can't vote for Ron Paul. I think it was Ron Paul or some other politician because he belongs to a church that allows musical instruments in the chapel, and he would have a problem voting for someone whose whose church allows musical instruments in the chapel. And I remember thinking. Really? I mean, he was a Christian too, but a, a seemingly insignificant detail like that was really important to him. And some people made, some people major in the minors and minor in the majors, and that is just so petty and, and dumb. Yeah, So, but it did make me think, how, how important are the details to Christians? Because some of our Christian denominations say accepting Christ isn't enough. You, if you don't accept our details, our precise rituals, you might not get into heaven. How important well, that, are the details? That's the Catholic Church all over again. Okay. Well, but to say the details aren't important at all, then there's not really a need to belong to any church, is there? Well, again, don't minor in the majors and major in the minors. Uh, if you're going to split a church because someone's got a bass guitar or a drum set, that's pretty dumb. Um, 
That's pretty dumb. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, some of the instruments in the Old Testament, if you brought them into a church today, people would be like, "Whoa, this is loud and and it's got beat and it's and it's and it's and it's hip. I mean, drums and and whatnot." So, I I think God loves music. And I don't see contemporary instruments as necessarily a bad thing. Now, there's bad music. You can play bad stuff with those instruments, sure. And if, you're, if your church is playing bad music, that doesn't necessarily mean leave the church. Maybe try and fix the problem. Um, as for whether or not you vote someone into office because their church uses a musical instrument, frankly, what they do, whether or not they attend a church with musical instruments as, and what they do as a politician Frankly, to me, I, I just don't see a connection there. He can do a wonderful job as a politician and attend a church with musical instruments. So I just, I, I just see that as sort of just really dumb. I, I don't, I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. Well, I, I essentially said the same thing to him, and he, he immediately blocked me. So some people don't want to listen to reason. Fair enough. Again, minoring in the majors and major in the minors. Okay, Sean. Well, I have a. A whole bunch of other questions I want to ask you, but we could probably talk all night. Uh, I really. I'm not going anywhere. If you want to ask me a few more. Well, I I do. Um, I have to sign off in a little while, but yeah, I do, I do want to ask you a few more. The there's a verse I read today. Actually, I, I'm trying to find the exact verse, but it said something to the effect of. Um, God was crucified before the foundation creation of the world, the foundation yeah. of the world, yeah. What does that uh, mean? What does that mean? To God, God transcends time, and so his interaction from within time, because Christ was incarnate 2,000 years ago from our perspective in time, to God, that is an eternal reality, because there is no time for God. So everything God has thought or done Every, every action of God is an eternal action. It's part of the eternal nature of God. Everything God has ever done, is doing, or will ever do has eternally been present to God, present in the reality of what God is. That's a hard concept for us to understand as beings that exist in time. And so what we're seeing when we see Christ is we're seeing the eternal God and his eternal activity translated into time. That doesn't mean time, that doesn't mean God is in time. It means quite the opposite. It means time is in God, and that's, I mean, this this is so complex, and Augustine wrote a lot on this. And so the, the simple answer is this. Christ was eternally crucified in the sense that from eternity past, God has always endeavored to enter into humanity and be crucified and rise from the dead, all that. And at the same time, in order for that to actually come about from within time, it is part of the eternal activity of God, because that's how God acts. It's, it's, his, it's his nature. He must act out of his eternity. Well, some will say you know, that, that that kind of absolves humans from, of the wicked, their will. wickedness causing the, the sacrifice. Uh, no. No, because God has, I mean, God has eternally ordained that his interactions with... With humanity, knowing beforehand, you know uh, how which you know person would make which choice. It says, let's use Judas as an example. It says that Judas was foreordained to betray the Son of God and bring about that whole circumstance. Now, does that mean God overrode Judas', Judas freedom? Did Judas freely choose to betray Christ? The answer is yes. He freely chose, and God chose to allow him to freely choose to make that choice. And God already knew what he was going to choose, and God allowed him to do it. So. You've got this interaction between the omniscient God who knows everything, eternally acting with beings with freedom from within time, and the interaction between the two, though it might sound confusing and some would accuse it of being contradictory, just takes a little more time to think it through carefully, and you'll actually see it is compatible. So the concepts of human responsibility, man's freedom, and God's sub sovereignty... These uh, do these work in a complementary fashion, or do they cancel each other out? I would say complementary, absolutely. Scripture clearly teaches that man has choice. You know, God says, "Choose this day who you will serve." So God commands people to choose, and He can't command you to do something you don't have. And yet, man's freedom is allowed and granted by a sovereign 
God. So God is over and above and transcends human freedom and can even use it to bring about his own purposes. And yet at the same time, man is responsible and he is free for what he does. And these both operate at the same time if you don't want to use the word time, maybe, because remember, you're, you have one agent who is God who is outside time, one which is humanity who is inside time. What you've got is both these, the eternal God and the temporal man in some way interacting together. And I think that's sort of the beauty of, of Christ, which is you have the eternal God incarnate in humanity. And so you've got the meeting of the two again. And so it, it's part of the mystery, it's part of the miracle, and I think that's part of the glory of God. Yes. Um, I did want to ask you about your your experiences here on YouTube. Have, have they been largely positive or negative or both? The interesting thing about being a Christian is Jesus says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and persecutions and whatnot. So the cool thing about being a Christian is even the negative things are transformed into positive things and so at the end of the day you can honestly say that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose that's a promise in scripture so whatever I perceive of as negative strangely enough is a positive right and um, so well I mean we don't have to talk about it but I'm curious as to because when I really got started on YouTube I think you were gone. You had, had had left after some disagreements here. Um, what what did per precipitate you leaving? If you don't want to talk about it, we can. We don't have to. But I'm just curious. Sure, I can sum it up pretty quickly. Uh, you probably came in either. I had to leave twice. First, I had received death threats from Muslims, and so I shut down my channel. The second time, there was some disagreements with some atheists over video content and videos being taken down and DMCA'd and whatnot. And so we came to agreement, an agreement that I leave YouTube for a year, and so I did. Those are the two times. I'm not sure which time uh, you experienced, but that's pretty much the long short of it. Hmm. Well, I got the impression that you were... Um I don't know. It, it just seemed like you had a lot of uh, a lot of haters. Well, that, that that hasn't changed. So get used to it. You, I you just seemed you, you really seemed outnumbered. Uh, it didn't seem fair. Well, I mean, Jesus was outnumbered too. Uh, I, I think of David and Goliath. You've got the little Jewish boy versus the you know the twenty foot tall giant, and the little boy wins the fight, and that's. That's really the story of God. That's how it works. That's how he proves himself strong, is he doesn't raise up an Arnold Schwarzenegger to beat up, you know, uh, a little guy. He brings up the little guy to beat up the big guy. And that's when you look at the little guy and say, wow, God must be on you, your side. That's, that's how God works. And so it doesn't surprise me that there are more atheists on YouTube than Christians because Jesus said narrow is the way and straight is the gate that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. Few, meaning more people go to hell than to heaven. More people are enemies of God than friends of God. And that's just the reality on YouTube, and that's the reality in the real world. Yeah, but apparently somebody uh, tried to, or somebody did, in fact, reach into your real life and call in your parents. I mean, that's utterly, that's crossing the line. That Well, it, it is in the past, and there's no reason to really, you know, Okay. I'm all over it, sure. but uh, yeah, this is this is a real warfare, and it's a you know there there there's a battle going on, and people on both sides, uh, you know, they, they need to choose: is it is it God or or is it Satan? Uh, who are you going to follow? Now, an atheist would never admit to following Satan, but it, that is indeed who they're following, and uh, and that's the choice we all need to make. So count the cost and and fight for your general. Yeah, and it, and it's also just. It's completely uncalled for to try to contact somebody in real life if they well, haven't given you permission to do so. Yeah, I, I've never done that to any atheists, and uh, I hope. I mean, again, it's all in the past, and we don't. Re I, I don't really want to bring it up again. But you don't need to lecture me on the ethics of. Not that you're lecturing me. I, I just, yeah, I, I agree with you. But nevertheless, it, it is in the past, and it's best not to. It's best to forgive and forget. Right. It is, because I, I, <laughs> I've had my problems here, too, and I like to, I don't want to bring any of that up again, so. 
There you go. Well, yeah, it's been great, man. Thanks for uh, talking to me. Yeah, I'd love to do it again if you ever want to. I, I would. I would. I would like to have a follow-up interview. Um, I have, I've I've recorded this, so could I post it on my YouTube channel, or do you want to just – how do you want to do that? Yeah, sure. Go for it because um, it, it, it'll take me a while. Uh, yeah, just um, go for it, yeah. Uh, send me a link if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Okay.